going to tell you something that I think is true, that there is a connection between the confidence we have in a request being answered affirmatively and how bold we are in making that request. I think that has a lot to do with the context of relationships. Do you think that's true? Okay. Now, on the other side of that, I would say this is also true, that if we feel insecure or we doubt whether or not a request that we make will be granted, we're going to probably not be very bold in making that request. Does that make sense? I got a story about that same thing, and it's based on relationship. So you see, there's this girl in sixth grade. Her name was Erica Marshall. And Erica was the cutest girl in school. Between the bangs and the braces, I'm telling you what, Erica had it going on. And she was always wearing American Eagle, which in my... In my sixth grade class, it was like, you, you got to be wearing some American Eagle. And Erica was the captain of the cheerleading squad and all the boys who had big muscles and a little bit of facial hair. They were trying to date Erica because she was out of everybody's league. And I had never really talked to Erica, but I wanted Erica to be my girlfriend. And so me, sixth grade guy, I'm not a big man now, but back then I was a little dude. And I certainly didn't have no muscles. I certainly didn't have any facial hair. I was developmentally behind. I didn't hang with the cool guys. I didn't wear American Eagle. And on top of all that, I ran cross country. That was my sport. Like I didn't play football like these guys that were chasing after Erica. And so I went for it and I, I just, I, I, I totally was swinging for the fences. And I walk up to Erica and I'm very nervous. I'm very doubtful. And I say, Erica, will you be my girlfriend? I didn't really know Erica, but I went very sheepishly into this situation, having no relationship with her. And guess what? Erica did not accept my offer to be in a relationship with me. You see, on the other hand, if we have confidence and an expectation that our requests are going to be granted based on relationships, we are emboldened to make even outrageous requests, bold requests. You see, uh, there's a restaurant in our neighborhood called Wally's Restaurant. It actually sits right behind my house. Wally's is a place that my family's been a time or two. In fact, I've, I've spent a lot of breakfasts and lunches at Wally's. And in the recent time, the manager of Wally's has referred to me as their best customer. And on one hand, this is kind of embarrassing, right? And on the other hand, it really is pretty honoring and just established a relationship here. Uh, one of the reasons is because for over the last year, uh, three days every month, I go and pick up somewhere between a dozen and two dozen biscuits at the crack of dawn to take to our men's ministry events. They love me. I mean, that, some of the waitresses give our kids presents when they come in. It's crazy. They, they just love us. And so one, one day, me and Megan, we were both sick. This is back in January, and we couldn't be around nobody, and we couldn't go cook our own food. We were so sick, and we couldn't go out and get food. We were so sick. And so we call Wally's based on our relationship, and, and we know we're going to make a, a bold request. And we say, hey, y'all, we're sick. We need some help. Would you mind to bring us some food? This is not one of their services. It is not something that they offer. But based on relationship, we felt emboldened to make that request. What was so kind is that the waitress who answered is a good friend of ours, and she certainly did bring us that food. She dropped it on our front porch, and she didn't even make us pay for it. This is beautiful. We made this bold request, and we, we just saw the way that this relationship carried it forward. This morning, y'all, we're going to look at a passage where Jesus teaches us to pray. And there's a whole lot that we could take away from this passage, but there's one thing that's really, really clear. This is our main idea this morning. God's fatherly love and his promises to us invite us to pray with a shameless audacity. I'm going to repeat that. God's fatherly love and promises to us invite us to pray with a shameless audacity. So what I'm going to invite you to do now is just either to yourself, as you think, as you pray, as you journal, perhaps you talk to somebody next to you. I want, to, I want you to add, just think about this question. With what level of confidence and boldness and expectancy do you pray? I'm going to give you two minutes to think about that, to talk about that. At what level do you pray with boldness and expectancy on your daily life? Go ahead. 
I'd love that conversation to continue with yourself and the Lord and those who ever are near you, but we should keep going and study God's Word together. Let's pray. Father, our Father, our Daddy in Heaven, thank You that we come in here pronouncing that You have accepted us as sons and daughters with full access. We love You and we thank You. Father, on this jury day, please warm us. Warm us through the love of God. Father, this morning, if there's anyone who is too comfortable, I do pray that you would disrupt them through the gospel. And if anyone is, in fact, disrupted, Lord, please bring them your immediate gospel comfort through the Holy Spirit abiding in our hearts. Father, for this time, I just pray that you would make up what is lacking um, in our hearts, in our faith, in my preaching, and always, Lord, that you would reign and that you draw us closer to yourself. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, y'all, I got a little outline for you. We're going to walk through this passage. We've got three things. First, we're going to consider what to pray. We're going to also look at how to pray. And then we're going to look at why we can pray as we are invited to. So first, we're going to look at what to pray. And this is found in the first couple verses of Matthew chapter 11. Here's a little context for you. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, this is how I want you to pray. This is what I want you to pray. First thing I want to say here, even before we get into this, is that the answer to what we are supposed to pray is kingdom-centered prayers. I want you to repeat that. What are we supposed to pray? Kingdom-centered prayers. Okay, throughout this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the next couple verses. We see kingdom-centered prayers, and we see kingdom promises. And I'm going to explain both of those things as we walk through this passage. All right, verse 2, Jesus says, When you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be your name. First, we just have to understand how big of a deal it is that Jesus is inviting us to pray to the Lord God the creator of the universe, the sustainer, the king of kings and lord of lords as our daddy. That's a big deal. Daddy. Hallowed be your name. That word means nothing in America today. Hallowed, what is that? That means glorify yourself. Lord, daddy, glorify yourself. That is a kingdom prayer because we are praying for him to glorify himself not for Him to glorify ourselves. And what's so beautiful about this is that throughout Scripture, we see that this is a gospel promise that the Lord is chiefly zealous for His own glory and He will glorify Himself in all things. Amen? Do you see both the kingdom-centered prayer and do you see the gospel promise? Do you see it? All right, we're going to keep going. He says, we should pray like this, Your kingdom come calling on the name of the Lord, our daddy, your kingdom come. This is a kingdom prayer saying, Lord, I care more about your kingdom than I care about my kingdom. Kingdom centered prayer. That's what happens when we fall in love with Jesus. He changes our heart and he continues to change our heart in such a way that we actually can pray kingdom centered prayers, but it goes further that we know throughout Scripture from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, what's going to happen? The Lord is going to bring His kingdom. Do you know this? It's a promise. And not just that one day down the road, but in our own hearts, in our own marriages, in our own lives, in our own parenting, there's a way in which there's an alreadiness that the Lord is making His kingdom known here in Mosaic Fellowship and in China, and in Chattanooga, and all over the world, as He's manifesting His grace and glory. Amen? Oh, good. The next thing, He says to us to pray, give us each day our daily bread. Let me translate that. He is not inviting us to pray for our own abundance. This is a kingdom-centered prayer that basically means, Lord, will you meet my basic everyday necessities? Would you allow me the grace that I would depend on you daily? That's kingdom-centered. And it's also a promise that we see throughout Scripture 
If nowhere else, in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus considers all the ways that we might be anxious about our daily necessities, he says, do not seek after these things, but rather seek after the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. This is a kingdom-centered prayer and this is a kingdom promise. Amen? He says to us, we should pray and ask the Lord to forgive our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. There's a beautiful way in which the way that we experience grace vertically, right here, us and God, demonstrates itself in our relationships horizontally. That as we seek the Lord's forgiveness, we manifest that in our daily lives in such a way that we may not actually have tasted the grace of Jesus and the forgiveness if we don't issue that to people in our daily lives. Does that make sense? So there's this beautiful promise there that the Lord throughout Scripture does show us that this is exactly how it works, that our hearts are changed by His grace and that we do forgive those who are indebted to us. Do you see it? Amen? Kingdom prayer and kingdom promise. And lead us not into temptation. Yes, Lord, don't, because we will fail. And the beautiful promise is that the Lord is not the author of sin, nor does he lead us to sin, but he allows us to be tempted. This is a promise that he will not lead us into temptation. So I just want to pose this lingering question to you as we look at all of this, that we certainly know is fulfilled in Jesus, as he gives us access through our own hearts and spirits being regenerated, that the kingdom comes into our life, that we start to care about the kingdom, and that ultimately these promises are fulfilled through Jesus for the kingdom. Here's the lingering question. I want you to just take a second, perhaps now and over the next 30 years, and consider, do your prayers seek to build your kingdom or the kingdom of God? Can we just, can we just talk about that over the next couple years? Do your prayers seek to build your kingdom or the kingdom of God? So we've looked at how this passage shows us what Jesus wants us to pray. Now, let me show you how Jesus is inviting us to pray. This is in verse 5 through 8. How does he invite us to pray? With a shameless audacity. So you repeat. How does Jesus invite us to pray? You say it. With a shameless audacity. Look at verse 5 through 7. It says this. And Jesus said to them, which of you? This is a hypothetical, preposterous question. He is trying to get at a, a situation that would never present itself. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, your neighbor, hey friend, listen, lend me three loaves of bread. Here's why. A friend of mine has arrived on a journey from out of town and I have nothing to set before my friend. And this friend, this neighbor that you go to, He's going to answer you from within his house. Don't bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. This would never happen. It's a preposterous hypothetical question. Now we know, yeah, certainly somebody could arrive from out of town and show up at midnight. Sure, back then, now, same. No big deal. But in this time period, this is preposterous. They could show up at midnight, but this situation would never happen because in this time, hospitality and hosting was such a big deal that you were honor bound to provide for someone their needs and to host them well in such a way that if, if somebody showed up at my house at midnight and I went to my neighbor in this time period and I said, will you give me some bread? I'm out of bread. I have nothing to give my, my friends. They would be honor bound to provide for you. And for them, your friend, to not do this would actually be to cast shame upon you. It would not be honoring the friendship, the relationship, the love that is there. It would actually be communicating contempt and that you are an enemy and that I want nothing to do with you. This is a hypothetical, preposterous thing that Jesus is, uh, is suggesting to us. And then this friend <laughs> the so-called friend, he would respond in normal life and answer right away and give him whatever he needs. But here, this friend gives four different ways that he won't do it. Do not bother me. The door is now shut. 
the children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Never happen. Never happen. And then Jesus tries to bring it on home to us. Verse 8, he says this, I tell you, though he will not give up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his impotence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. That word impotence, that's another word that I don't hear a lot in my daily life when I'm going to the gym here in Chattanooga. How about you? I don't hear that one. Hollowed, impotence, what are those things? Well, impotence, I think this is significant. This is the only time that the Bible has this word in it. That's important. That means that whoever wrote this, Luke, he has gone into culture to try to find the perfect word to articulate something that has significance. And that word is rightfully translated impotence or persistence or impertence. There's several variants, but unpacking the significance of it is the word shameless audacity. Okay? So Jesus is saying it's not because of the friendship that he will answer you, but because of your shameless audacity. Not because of the friendship, not because of the honor that is on the line, but the shameless audacity. Y'all, I was thinking about this, and I, I received a text message a while back from a pretty good friend. It was quite actually at midnight. And they made a request of me that made me just kind of be curious. Like, I, am I reading this right? I didn't know what to make of it. It was a very bold request. I can't talk about it. But it was nothing sinful or scandalous. It was right and appropriate. But it, was, it caught me off guard. And I was happy to meet that request. And what I want to suggest to you is the way that that made me feel, I think is something about how the Lord feels when we make those requests of Him. When I got that shameless and audacious request in the middle of the night, I felt loved. I felt like, oh my goodness, look at the trust in our relationship. I felt like, oh my gosh, I feel set apart and distinguished and trusted and honored by this request. And y'all, it was absolutely my eager privilege to meet that request. Y'all, in this parable, this little parable that Jesus is telling, he's showing us that the relationship would dictate that the request would be answered. It certainly would. But the relationship is on the line. The friendship is on the line. Love itself is on the line. Honor is on the line. But even if those things were overlooked, it is the pure shameless audacity that causes this person to respond with favor. And he's trying to teach us about God. Okay? He's trying to teach us about how we are encouraged to pray with a shameless audacity. And this, again, is all because of how Jesus ushers us into the full access of the loving Father who will entertain these audacious prayers. So, certainly, the context of relationship is important. We need a great deal of confidence and trust in the relationship if we're going to pray like that. That's kind of why I'm asking you these lingering questions. I want to see us all just consider those things together. So we've seen in this passage how Jesus is teaching us what to pray. We've seen in this passage how he's showing us how to pray. And now we're going to see why we can pray with this shameless audacity. And the simple answer is because of his love and promises. Why can we pray this way? Because of his love and promises. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 9. Jesus says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Y'all, in the Greek language, what this was originally written in, these words, ask, seek, and knock, are in this particular form. And that particular form means that they're to be translated in the continuation. Asking, seeking, and knocking. Perpetual and continual. Okay? The way that we're encouraged to ask, asking, the perpetual nature of it, really carries with it 
a demandingness, a bold demand that says, I will not stop asking you. And in fact, to a degree, I might even feel entitled here. I need this. I want this. Give it to me. This makes me think of my son Stone. He's running around usually. He's about this tall, blonde head kid. Not a bad kid, but you know, rambunctious. Stone had a birthday on Tuesday. And we told Stone before dinner, we're like, hey, buddy, today's your birthday. Buddy, you want some ice cream after dinner? And he's like, yeah, you know, doing the whole thing. And I can't tell you how many times the kid asked for ice cream after that. It was unbelievable. I mean, the kid eats a really poor dinner. And then all of a sudden he's asking for ice cream, going to the freezer, trying to get it out. He won't stop saying ice cream. I've probably heard it 35 times. And it wasn't a question. He was asking in the spirit and an energy of a demand saying, give me ice cream or I'll die. Eventually we did give him some ice cream. But here, this is what I want you to catch. Jesus is saying, pray like that. Pray like that. What is this seeking? This perpetual seeking. Seeking and searching. Like, don't stop. Don't stop. How much resolve do you got? He's not testing you. But hey, keep seeking. Keep searching. All right? When I lose my wallet or I lose my keys, everything stops. Have you ever lost your wallet or keys and you need to go somewhere and you're late? It's like, hey, you're starting to recruit people. You're like, hey, knocking on doors. Can you come? Can you help me look through my car? Hey, 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 Eden. Hey, Stone. Can you help me, Megan, please? Like everything is on lockdown. I will find my wallet and my keys. I have to. Pray like that. The perpetual continuation of your seeking cannot stop. Knocking. Perpetual knocking. My neighbor, he's got a sweet dog. That dog stays inside. Not a bad dog, not an angry dog. He ain't gonna bite nobody, but that dog stays inside. One day I saw that dog running through the neighborhood and I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to help. I knew my neighbor was home. I saw him that morning. His car was parked in the front yard. He works from home. My neighbor was home. He did not respond to my text. I went and knocked on his door. I was committed to getting his attention for his sake and for his dog. I did not stop knocking, y'all. Like my hand, I started going like this because it took a long time. I started switching hands. I was thinking about jumping over the back fence and knocking on the back door. I was going to get his attention. Jesus says, pray like that. Pray like that. This perpetualness to our asking, our seeking, and our knocking with full confidence. Now in context, it's important for us to just understand, Jesus is not saying if you pray with confidence and a a bold, audacious shamelessness, you're going to get whatever you want. In context, what are we talking about? You said it. Yeah. We're supposed to pray for the kingdom like that. Not for your personal glory, not for your empire. It doesn't work that way. Makes me think of uh, George Bailey. Anybody know who George Bailey is? About, About December, you might see George Bailey on your TV. TBS or CBN, I don't know what station. George Bailey is from this movie, It's a Wonderful Life, a 1946 movie where the center character, George Bailey, lives in this city called Bedford Falls. And George Bailey goes throughout his life, childhood and adulthood, into this drugstore. And I don't know what it is. It's some kind of cigar lighter. And he grabs the thing and he says, I wish I had a million dollars. And he lights the thing. And every time the thing comes on, he's like, hot dog, answered prayer, hope. See, what's, what's interesting about this is that <laughs> he was trying to build his own kingdom with this prayer, this, this hopefulness for a million dollars. But if God granted George Bailey his prayer to have him have a million dollars in 1946, George Bailey would have spent the rest of his life in exotic places and he would have never come back to Bedford Falls. But in God's kindness to George Bailey, he did not answer that prayer. And in God's kindness, okay, so this is, 
this is not real, but I'm just, you know, stay with me. Because this prayer was not answered, George Bailey's life was given in the service of people in the community. And though the man was poor, like objectively had no money, at the end of the movie, in a very ironic way, a man of great honor says to him, to George Bailey, the richest man in town, based on relationships and his service to the community. It's beautiful. You see, there's a kindness in God not answering our prayers. Just like Erica Marshall, I used to pray that I'd end up with this girl named Leslie McKinney. Thank you. I don't know what she's doing these days, but that's not what I should be seeking. Here's a couple things that we've been praying for, both myself, this congregation, and the wider community that knows and supports and prays for Mosaic Fellowship. There's a lot of ways in which what we're doing as a church plant just manifests a little piece of the kingdom of God that we should pray for and that we should anticipate answers. That we prayed that the Lord would provide enough financial resources that we could be a church. He's doing it. That we prayed in the middle of the heat of summer or in the heat of spring, really, that the Lord would give us a place to worship. He did it. That the Lord would offer us an opportunity to see somebody come to faith. I expect Him to do more, but we've had one. That we've asked the Lord to equip us and grow us in His grace and to make us the family of God. I think He's done it. I think He's doing it. I think He'll do it. I want to invite you to pray with me and with us and for us in a couple distinct ways. With bold expectation, according to the kingdom that we seek, that the Lord would give us a harvest, a plethora of folks who come to faith through the ministry of our church, through the ministry of your families and you as individuals, that we would have three people come to faith through the outreach that we do through our missional community groups this semester. Can we pray that? That brings God glory. Let's pray that. That we would actually have a very effective ministry to these neighborhoods here and to the city and that we would more and more and more come to reflect the way this neighborhood looks as a cross-cultural church in a cross-cultural neighborhood. Will you pray it? That brings God glory. We're looking for a place to have our permanent home. I would love to see us come into a piece of land that I know about. We need you to pray even today for that very thing. Will you pray for it? (laughs) Y'all, we got to keep going. Let's look at this. Verse 11. Jesus says, what father among you? Here's again, another hypothetical, preposterous question. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish? will instead of a fish, give him a serpent or a snake. If he asks for an egg to eat, will he give him a scorpion? In both situations here, what we're seeing is the same thing. A child who a father loves and delights in and wants to provide for is put forth this question, will you provide for my hunger? And what father among you, you you fathers, you sinful fathers, whose fatherly love is tainted with your own selfishness at times, like mine. Which father among you would actually return this request with something that is dangerous for your child? Something that doesn't meet their immediate basic necessities, but actually does them harm and scares them to death. If Campbell were to ask for a banana, Would you give him a granddaddy long leg that you found in the closet? The kid would need therapy right away. And he'd still be hungry. I mean, goodness, if Caleb asked for a stuffed animal and y'all gave him razor blades to play with, like what? Are you serious? If Ruby asked for a box of nerds and you gave her a box of rat poison, are you serious? That's what Jesus is trying to communicate here. That's crazy. He says, look, if you fathers who are evil, tainted with your own sin, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? Jesus is making a really important lesser to greater argument. He's saying, if this is true, 
which it is, y'all wouldn't do that, then this is so much more true. So much more true. Gives us full confidence in those things. Now, when it, he references the Holy Spirit here, and I just when I'm studying this passage, I'm like, why is that in there? I didn't see that coming. But what's happening here is that Jesus is encouraging us to pray for the kingdom and for our necessities and for all the ways that he would be glorified. And he says, not only will I meet those needs, I will give you my very self, my very spirit to be with you, to live inside of you and to guide you into all righteousness. Y'all, this is the gospel that Jesus gives us the full access that we desire to a heavenly father who is not tainted with sin who responds positively to our request, who seeks to glorify himself and allows us to participate in that, that Jesus through his death and resurrection has given us full access to the Lord. The glory is his. So throughout the whole scripture, the whole redemptive story, that we're born as enemies of God, strangers and aliens to him, not part of his family, not part of his friendship, his circle, if you will, and that Through Jesus, we are brought in and adopted into the family of God as sons and daughters of the King. What that means is that we can and we should pray with shameless audacity, continually asking, continually seeking until we find and continually knocking with the full commitment to not stop until the Lord answers and gives and we find and the door is opened. That's what the Lord wants us to do in our relationship with him. Not about our stuff, but he wants us to learn that kind of relationship with him in the context of prayer. And we need to. Friends, that's the gospel. That those of us, all of us who have no access to the Lord through our brokenness and our sin, we are given the kind of access to the Lord that's like a child scared by the thunderstorm and the loud lightning in the middle of the night that crawls into the bed of their mommy and daddy and is not sent back to bed. The Lord loves us and He wants to show us exactly how He loves us and how He will bring glory to Himself. And He wants us to pray in such a way. And in fact, in God's sovereignty and kindness, He uses our prayers to do that very thing. Amen. 